Welkom bij C Majeur. Als u een liefhebber bent van orgels, dan zit u vandaag goed bij ons. En dan bedoel ik orgels in de meest brede zin van het woord. U kunt namelijk gaan kijken naar mijn Engelse collega Howard Goodall. Uh, Howard Goodall, een man die muziek studeerde op het Christchurch College in Oxford. En daarna allerlei dingen deed die met muziek te maken hebben. Zo componeerde hij diverse musicals, waaronder de Hired Man. En zijn meest recente musical heet The Kissing Dance, die afgelopen januari werd uitgevoerd in Covent Garden. Daarnaast schrijft Goodall ook nog eens een keer allerlei tv-tunes. En is hij, en dat wist ik helemaal niet, al twintig jaar verantwoordelijk voor de muziek in de producties van Rowan Atkinson. Oftewel Mr. Bean, en die kent u wel. En dan maakt hij ook nog eens een keer ontzettend leuke muziekprogramma's over koren en orgels. Vorige week heeft u in aflevering 1 van Organ Works kunnen zien dat hij op, op zoek ging naar de oudste orgels van de wereld. Vandaag vervolgt hij zijn rondreis en komen de hele grote en grootst klinkende orgels ter sprake. Nu krijgt u straks het grootste kerkorgel van de wereld te zien, maar ook het allergrootste orgel en dat staat notabene in een shopping mall in Amerika ergens. Verder komen harmoniums, eh, theaterorgels en draaiorgelachtige aan bod. Maar ook de laatste ontwikkelingen op het gebied van digitale keyboards komen ter sprake. Op het einde van het programma zit nog een verrassende luistertest, waarin mensen geblinddoekt moeten constateren of ze nu naar een echt pijporgel luisteren of naar een gesampeld digitaal orgel. Straks hoort u de uitslag. Nu eerst het woord aan collega Howard Goodall en zijn organ works. Hello, this is Café Hell in Kufstein in the Austrian Tyrol. And this ice cream is called the Kufstein organ. Mm. <laughs> This is the original non-fattening Kufstein organ, built inside an ancient fortress to commemorate the fallen of the Great War. This giant instrument is played 365 days a year for a special 20-minute recital and is nothing if not loud. Its unique sound can be heard not only by the tourists who gather around the organist's hut at the foot of the castle, but throughout the town and right across the valley. From the 19th century onwards, the organ went walkabout. It escaped from its traditional home, the church, and found itself in more and more unexpected places, like this fortress in the Tyrol. And quite honestly, once it did get out into the world, it went ever so slightly mad. It got bigger, it got louder, and it got attitude. And to build big, loud organs with attitude, not surprisingly, required vast sums of money. The richest people in the world have always had a bit of a thing about having their own organs. And in the 19th century, the richest people in the world were British. This is Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire, the ancestral home of the Dukes of Marlborough. Now, if I had to make a list of the ten most beautiful organs in England, this organ would certainly be on that list. A grateful monarch gave the fantastic palace in which it stands to the Duke of Marlborough as a reward for winning the Battle of Blenheim, which was in 1704, as you know. Now, 150 years later, a descendant of his, the eighth Duke of Marlborough, commissioned an organ. 
Well, actually, he installed two. He didn't like the first one, and he replaced it with this, which was an excellent decision, because this instrument was built in 1891 by the finest of the English Victorian organ builders, Henry, or Father, Willis. The current Duke of Marlborough heard me playing and came to see what was going on. Hey, Hello, Grace. Good afternoon. Um, it's a wonderful treat to come and hear this and see and play this beautiful instrument. Um, now, you put in motion some very serious restoration work on this organ. Well, I was the owner of this wonderful instrument, and I said that uh, we must put it back to what it should be. Now, you say that you don't play at all, but your grandfather did something to this organ, which is rather unique, didn't he? Perhaps you could tell us about that. Well, the, the, the pianola, uh, yes. the, the organola, whatever it's called, <laughs> which uh, plays roles. Uh, there was a quite amusing story about this uh, Welt player, actually. My grandfather was entertaining some people here yeah. one evening, and he wanted to pretend to them that he could uh, play the organ, so he had this all set up. Unfortunately, just before he got to the chair, the thing started playing. <laughs> that, it was a technical hitch, and he was caught out. <laughs> well, it probably serves him right, I mean, he's <laughs> pretending to play. Should we go up and have a look at it? Yeah. Uh, it's really just a large box from this view, isn't That's it? That's right. You, um, could, you could call it a duke box. Oh, well, you could do. <laughs> I gather we, we, we you, move you this down, down yeah. and, and up. That's the other one. That, that's right. Anyway, now that. Wagner should come out of the organ. Now, I'm going to have to go and help pull the stops out, aren't I? Yes, that's right. <laughs> In 19th century England, the organ became fashionable, and not just in stately homes. It found an eager new audience in grand public buildings, like this one here at St George's Hall in Liverpool, thanks to a new class of aristocrats. But wealth and power in Imperial Britain also belonged to captains of industry, and these magnates wanted to bring the music of the masters to the masses. What they did was build huge neoclassical concert halls, and in them, imperial-sized organs. The builder they usually called upon, as at Blenheim, was Father Willis. Henry Willis IV still continues in his great-grandfather's organ-building tradition. He even shares his ancestors' Victorian work ethics. Um, tell me a little bit about a big Victorian builder like Willis. I mean, was this a big operation? How many people will have worked there? Now, there's an interesting point. All of them, as opposed to nowadays when almost none of them work. Ah. <laughs> but there were 380 of, of them really? in the firm. Do you know why Willis developed so well over the years? Because it really became such a premier builder, didn't they? Yes. It developed partly because of his interest in music and, the, and music in the church, partly because he was uh, extremely self-assured, as many Willises are reputed to be, and of course he wasn't hampered by the Briberies and Corruptions Act 1901, which uh, g gave a much freer hand to people who in those days were able to have patrons. Uh, he was wise enough to have patrons, indeed sometimes more than one, unknown to each other, the normal technique was to get the church to pay for half the organ and each of the pa patrons to pay for half as well. This made some organ building quite profitable. Was he a colourful character? Do we know much about him? Well, we know that he was uh, <coughs> married to his second wife, who was his first wife's sister, courtesy of a vicar of a London church at the time, although it was illegal. That church has a three-manual Willis organ for which they never paid and which does not <laughs> appear in our books. <laughs> Uh, when they were making these huge town hall organs in the 19th century, um, there was a sort of feeling of trying to outdo each other, wasn't there? Sort of certainly. Rivalry. Certainly. That was the I, time. I, I want one bigger and better than the one you just built down the road. Because <laughs> I'm a richer mill owner. <laughs> there must have been more to it than that. There must have been something that 
that really made people want this Willis sound rather than anybody else's? Well, it was merely because the Willis sound was available in so many concert halls and um, town halls and city halls and the Royal Albert Hall and the Alexander Palace and St. Paul's Cathedral, Canterbury Cathedral, Gloucester Cathedral, Hereford Cathedral, Exeter Cathedral, and so forth. And the people were snobs, and they wanted the best. And uh, they were determined that the best was Willis, and Willis assured them that the best was Willis, and they purchased it. The 19th century uh, music for organ is full of um, transcriptions of orchestral pieces of the time as well. There's a, very much a symphonic sound, isn't there? Of course. There was no radio, television, or things stuffed in people's ears, mm. and they wanted to hear music. So, for example, here in the St. George's Hall in Liverpool, there were two recitals on a Saturday. One was for the musically educated snobs who came in the late afternoon, and the other was for the Hoi Polloi, who paid a penny to get in, which was a lot of money. Mm. And this was why the transcriptions were written, which is why the organs played the stuff they did. It was a bit like classics for pleasure before its time, wasn't it? I've never heard of classics for pleasure. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> Most people only saw huge organs like those at big public concerts. But the Victorians didn't want just to listen to music, they were great doers. And if you wanted to play the organ in your own home and you couldn't afford Henry Willis, there was a cheaper, more portable alternative. The idea of an organ just made up of reeds, no pipes, and a simple pair of bellows wasn't, of course, a new one. But when it was reinvented in the 1880s, the reed organ, or harmonium, became immensely popular. It still is, in fact, with Phil Fluke, who has a stupendous collection of them here on the edge of Bradford in the Victorian village of Saltair. There's the man himself, Phil. Hello, Howard. Hello. What are you up to there? Welcome to the Reed Organ and Harmonium Museum. I'm just doing a bit of work on Bose and K's N Harmonic Harmonium. Right. Um, putting some reeds back into place. Well, I hope you feel better a bit later. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Yeah, and you. It's a really an amazing collection, this. I mean, how many years has it taken to collect all this? Just over 20 years. I went to buy a piano for my wife, came home with a harmonium. It didn't work. I learned how to fix it, and it drove me mad. Oh, and do you fix them all from this uh, equipment round here, all these? Yes, I use many original tools yeah. still. And of course, I use hot animal glue, lambskin tanned with salt and alum, all the, mm. all the original materials. Yeah. Yeah, there's an original bottle of Grolsch there, which is presumably a very important ingredient. <laughs> <laughs> well, show me around some yes. of the... I mean, there are different models around the place. There's large instruments here from the classic... Phil took me on a tour of some of his favourite harmoniums. Yes. The ladies' boudoir model. Ah. 1881. I've always wanted to sit in the ladies' boudoir. Well, of course, you'd need a bustle to oh, sit yes. over the rail at the back. Yes. You have all the velvet drapes around the boudoir. Yeah. So they've echoed those under the keyboard. Yes. And, of course, it's black, which was very fashionable because of Prince Albert dying. Queen Victoria wore black for the rest of her life. Now, if I remember rightly, these two sort of prongs here on the side, you move with your knees. That's correct, Make yes. it get louder and softer. Does this yes. one work? Can I play Yes, it, it? does, yes. Well, let me pull yes. some stops out. Well, it feels very much like a lady's boudoir when I It does, isn't it? Yeah. Quite a delicate little instrument. Yes, really. and there's Queen Victoria sitting Indeed there. So. Yes. They sent these things all over the empire, didn't they? They were transported to most countries. I've even a picture of one of them being transported on the back of a camel in Egypt. Really? What about other favourites of yours? Well, I have a little device here that, um, you know, sort of delights people. If you want to go on holiday, you can't find a replacement organist for a Sunday. You bought one of these, popped it on the top of the keyboard. The organist would write out the tune for you in yeah. numbers. 
Yeah. And when you press down the numbered button... So anybody can play with two fingers and no musical talent. Yeah, but what happened when the organist came back and they said, well, thanks very much, but we don't need you after all, we've got the knobs. Look, I've even heard some people say that this is better than some organists because at least it plays the right chords. Mm. <laughs> Most people think that the harmonium's gone out of fashion these days. Well, it just shows how wrong you can be. From Bombay to Bradford, the portable harmonium is still the centrepiece of a living musical tradition. The next chapter of the organ's development concerns an eccentric telephone engineer called Bob. Robert Hope Jones was an English inventor who, whilst chief electrician of the Lancashire and Cheshire Telephone Company, invented the diaphone, an organ pipe so frighteningly loud it was used by coast guards all over the world as a foghorn. <laughs> Anyway, in 1903, Hope Jones emigrated to America, where he set up an organ company with a financial backing of Mark Twain. Sadly, just six years later, the company went bust, and the patents and plants were bought by a Mr. Rudolf Wurlitzer. Wurlitzer went on to make 20-odd thousand theatre organs, a lot of money, and history. Poor Hope Jones, on the other hand, took his own life, never knowing what foot-tapping joy his inventions would bring for generations to follow. Blackpool's Tower Ballroom, people have been dancing to the mighty Wurlitzer every summer season since 1930. Most of them rather better than me. Wurlitzer maestro Phil Kelsall has been organist at the Tower Ballroom for 22 years. Yes, well, the other dancers breathe a sigh of relief as I leave the dance. You're very good. You've been practicing. <sighs> Not really. No. <laughs> so we've got the mighty Wurlitzer here. What makes this different from, say, a traditional church organ, then? Well, basically, is the, is the tremulance and the, the stop layout. On the church organ, we have the classic diapason sound we all know. But on this organ, the basic sound is called the tibia, which is a wooden pipe, and uh, on its own, sounds like a flute, really. Yeah. But when we add the tremulant, we get a shimmering tone, which is so uh, synonymous with the cinema organ. But the Wurlitzer keyboard doesn't only play pipes. Hidden in a loft high above the organ is a huge box of musical tricks. You also have um, special effects and percussion on an organ like this, don't you? Yes, we do indeed. Uh, these instruments were designed to accompany the silent film, so we've, consequently we have things built in like horses hooves, snare drum, a tambourine, there's the xylophone, sleigh bells. And down on the pedal, uh, we have a, a train. As film soundtracks became more sophisticated, most Wurlitzers sank below the stage forever.
Some of them are now in private homes and collections. Many others have sadly been destroyed. However, the electrical technology that allowed theatre organs to expand also opened up new possibilities, even in the church. From the turn of the century, a race began to build ever more impressively sized instruments. And although Passau Cathedral in Germany is pretty huge, if you really want big, big, you've got to come to America. The biggest church organ in the world is in here, the Cadet Chapel of the West Point Military Academy. Now, at first sight, it looks really rather like any church organ, so I think some further investigation may be required. The West Point organ owes its vast size to an unusual tradition. Over the last 85 years, the families of cadets killed in action have been able to commemorate their loved ones with a donation of organ pipes. David Friedel, the curator of the West Point organ, led me to the nerve center that makes this massive machine possible. What are these big banks of electrical things here? Well, these are the relays, console relays. When the organist uh, plays any key, one of these is activated. You can actually watch the player play without hearing the, the organ. Is, with the organ above us now thundering away, I feel like this is, we're in the scene from the Phantom of the Opera or something, in this well, underground room and the bellows heaving away. It's very much like that. Should we go and have a look at uh, some other rooms? There's plenty to see. You okay. go ahead. This system of electrical relays has liberated the organ from the console. Now, the only limit to the number of pipes is the size of your building. If you can squeeze in here, Howard, this is the 32-foot Ophiclide. Oh, my goodness. It looks like huge central heating pipes. It was put in here because there wasn't enough room to stand it up in the organ. Yes. Would you like Can we to try one? Sure. Push one of those valves in. Now, there's a man sound for you. <laughs> Sounds like a foghorn. It's a man sound. <laughs> Can't you picture yourself out on your boat? <laughs> Everybody gets out of your way. I can picture myself on my own somewhere. I tell you, making a noise like this. <laughs> I don't have many friends left, do you? <laughs> uh, see, the organ full of variety and spice. Okay, I'm going up there, am I? Go right ahead. I feel like a chimney sweep. May, may be a bit dusty for you. Oh, dust. Uh, it's nothing. Six, six floors, straight up. Right. Carry, oh, <laughs> miles up. Oh. That's the harmonic organ, and it's it's six stories high. Ah, right. It's very easy to lose someone in this division. <sighs> yes. Hmm. More organ. <sighs> no, that's not right. <sighs> How on earth they tune these things, I do not know. Keep expecting to find some old organist who's been left up here. You must get pretty fit coming up these days, don't well, you? Well, you would think I would. I, I wish I was more fit. It's a long way up here. Now, Howard, around this corner here, up a few steps, is the hidden treasure. The hidden treasure. <laughs> it's the swell division. Goodness, it's colossal. Don't you guys ever know when to stop building? Not till we run out of space. Well, I think I've seen enough pipes to last me a lifetime, Dave. What kind of console would drive an organ like this? A large one. Well, there's big, and there's jai blooming enormous. This petrified forest is just one small part, the string division, of the world's largest organ, the Wanamaker organ in Philadelphia. Whilst at West Point, the organ has an extravagant 20,000 pipes, 
The Wanamaker instrument weighs in at a giddy 29,000. The company founder, John Wanamaker, had the organ brought here in 1909 to what is now Hex Department Store. It's still played every day as an accompaniment to one of the great leisure pursuits of our time, shopping. This cathedral of commerce represents the highest peak of organ folly, but it is surely one of the wonders of the musical world. So far in this series, we've followed the development of the organ from the ancient world to the modern world. But what do we think about it now, at the end of the 20th century? What I can tell you is, it still does have a passionate following. For some people, the power of the organ is still irresistible. Take her out, Jacques. Thank you. We try to mix uh, anything mechanical up here. Yeah. Now show me some of your other hobbies. <laughs> Jacques Littlefield is a millionaire with a difference. On his vast estate, not far from San Francisco, he collects things. And we're not talking stamps or butterflies here. Jacques is into big machines in a big way. Tanks, trains, and organs. How long have they had the organ here? Well, it was put in in 1987, with additional work done in 1989 to add mm. the, the lowest top. So serious is Jacques about organs that he had one built in his own home. Gosh, it's absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you. We've had uh, a lot of fun on this one. Whilst this instrument produces a magnificent sound, what really gets Jacques's blood racing is how the thing works, its elegant mechanics. Ah, oh, the heart of the beast. Absolutely, absolutely. Now, these are lots of modern materials here, but actually this is quite a straightforward old-fashioned design, isn't that's it? That's correct, that's correct. If you were to look at uh, um, a design from the uh, the 1700s or bring an organ builder there, they would recognize virtually everything other than the electrical lights and some of the uh, uh, aluminum parts and whatever. Mm. In there. Yes, now these are the stop uh, pillars here, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, 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 these actuate the stops here, and then the, the pedals, uh, these are part of the pedal coupling mechanisms, and then these are the trackers. When you pull a key, it actually will uh, it will go from the key and then it will actuate over here. Yeah. And if you have a stop or two pulled on, you can actually hear the sound at that point. When you're in a, this part of the organ, you're, you're very happy, aren't you? Well, I, yeah, it, it's, I, I did particularly ask the builder to allow it uh, to be presentable from the back as well as the front. Mm. But there's something about the fact that this is where the air conditioning actually works. But well, this is the engine room, yeah. Yeah, it's sort of seductive, <laughs> isn't it? I can see absolutely, you're, absolutely. You're, you're very at home in, the, in this yeah. section. What I really want to do is have a go on it. Do you mind if I... Absolutely. I'd love to... Love to uh, oh. like it. One of the things that I enjoy the most is having organists come from, from far and near to, uh, to play and practice. Well, let's kind of have a play. <laughs> The organ is the most mechanical of musical instruments, and as we'll see in this program, it has taken full advantage of 20th century technology. From San Francisco to St. Albans, Hertfordshire, Kingdom. Yep, there's the place. St. Albans Organ Museum. Yeah. From the discovery of electricity to the creation of the microchip, the old-fashioned pipe organ has embraced new ideas and given birth to a plethora of mechanical and electrical offspring. 
Some of these children may be in obscure places, like the St. Albans Organ Museum, but they are cherished lovingly nonetheless. Hello. Hello. Ah, Bill. Hello, oh, Ty. <laughs> nice to see nice you. Nice to see you. What a fantastic collection you've got in here. It's just amazing, isn't it? Um, how many have you got of them? Four of these large organs and a visiting one today. And what exactly are they all? All mechanical organs used in dance halls, roadhouses, cafes in Belgium originally. Yes, Belgium was a sort of capital place Indeed, for a yes. mechanical organ. Indeed, yes, Antwerp particularly. Built yeah. around 1938, this one. Now you say organ, but I can see a saxophone and a piano accordion yeah. and well, bits of decoration. Hidden um, behind oh, the facade. Ah, yes, there we are. I found some pipes. I found some pipes. They're all in there, yes, hidden away. Yes. And in fact, that one over there has mm. got um, a lot of kind of percussion and accordions and things stuck on the Yes, outside, that's a much later one, the 1950s one. Yes. And this is jazz. We've got a, we've got a whole drum kit there. Um, yes. Does this play actual jazz tunes? Yes. Quite like capable that? of playing practically anything, but particularly jazz style music. Yeah. So they yeah. dance to this? Dance music yeah. is its prime. Thing. Putting yeah. musicians out of jobs. Probably, but then <laughs> the musicians weren't too reliable. Uh, <laughs> they couldn't go on all night, but well, this, this could. Um, can I hear something on this? Yes, we come is right it a, to a, a, a roll that you put in there. Yes, yes this is. Oh, uh, it's a kind of roll library. Selection um, of music we have. Goodness, is that old books, isn't it? Orient Express, Bell of the Ball, Toselli, Serenade, Liechtenstein, Polka. This is La Cuca Racha. You'd like Is to hear that, that one? Yes. No, yeah. Fantastic. Put that one on. Oh, yes. It's like a pianola, isn't it? With the um, perforated cardboard yep. set up in a four-part system. Yeah. Oh, there goes the blower. Yes. What is the fascination of mechanical organs? I mean, how did you get hooked? I don't know. I think it's a bit like steam engines. Once you're hooked, you're, <laughs> you're stuck with the things. Do you ever come in here on your own and just play them? Yes. <laughs> Usually in the Sunday morning before we open up for the public in the afternoon. You do this almost all the time, don't you? A large part of my time is taken up doing this, yes. Do you mind my asking, do you have a wife? No, I don't think any woman would put up with me in all my organistic <laughs> goings on. You could maybe find someone who had this shared the same interest, though. It's not for the lack of looking, but th they all seem to be single as well. Is there a reason for it's that? It's hard not to come to the conclusion that the 20th century's mechanization of the organ has a habit of turning its admirers into fanatics. And with every feat of engineering, a new breed of organ lover comes to the fore. <laughs> it was inevitable, really, that an instrument that was so involved with things mechanical would one day have an intimate relationship with electronics. And in 1931, an American chap called Captain Richard Ranger invented an instrument that made it sound purely electronically. No wind and no pipes. He called it the Ranger Tone, and it disappeared without trace. However, four years later, Mr. Lawrence Hammond of Chicago invented his electronic organ and it immediately became the stuff of legend. From Jimmy Smith and Fat Swaller to Keith Emerson and the James Taylor Quartet, the Hammond B3 has been revered, abused and adored since the day it was born. <laughs> Hammond replaced pipes with 91 rotating tone wheels, producing a new bluesy sound. Lots of 
lots of people have made electric organs over the years, but what is it about the Hammond B3 that's become so special? That's a good question. I, I'm not sure. Is it just the sound? Uh, it, it must be. C certainly it's only the sound, yeah. yeah. Um, Jimmy Smith claims that he's aware of 3,000 different preset sounds that he will use. Yeah. You know, 3,000 different sounds coming from them. That's a lot more than you'll get out of the average synthesizer, I think. Yeah. Because you've got this drawbar combination, yeah. which comes from the original organ. You know, that goes right back to the original church. It is a church organ, yeah. I mean, basically. <laughs> started going out and gigging in about 1981, 82, and the Hammond was just a dirty word at that point. Mm. In fact, the one I bought, I bought off a woman that wanted to sell it so she'd get enough money to buy a, a Yamaha DX7, mm. which, you know, does a very feeble Hammond yeah. impersonation. Uh, and, and I started carting it around, and people would say things like, couldn't you get that sampled, or couldn't you get things like that, do stuff like that. <laughs> so what's going to happen now? Right, well, Hammond thing? still make a Hammond, you know, but they yeah. don't make a C3 tone wheel Hammond. If I wanted to buy one tomorrow, I probably couldn't. I'd have to sort of hassle someone and offer them money way over the odds yeah. because, because they are very trendy at the moment. In the 1980s, the organ took what some would say was its most adventurous leap forward. Hammond organs don't have tone wheels inside them anymore. They make their sound digitally as indeed do all the other many varieties of home keyboard that you can get in what has become a global market. Such is the enthusiasm for the home electronic organ that you can even go on a specially themed holiday. Yeah. This is the Keyboard Cavalcade Spring Spectacular at Haven Holiday's Caister on Sea. Why do you come to a thing like this? Because we enjoy the music. I like the easy listening. Yes. Andrew Lloyd Webber is one of my sort of favourite kinds of music. And would you come again next year if it happened again? Oh, yes, indeed. Yes. 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 Even in a world devoted to the home enthusiast, there are star professional artists who travel the globe, demonstrating just what can be done with these organs if you practice hard enough. Will you please, ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together and give a great big keyboard cavalcade welcome to Chihau Sonomoto. Chiho was lured to the UK by Yamaha from her home in Japan. Now based in Newcastle, she is a concert virtuoso in her own right. This is really a sort of mini orchestra, isn't it? Because That's right. It's mm -hmm. not just organ pipe sounds, is mm -hmm. it? Tell me the sort of sounds that you would have on this instrument. We have uh, like a whole orchestra instrument, so like strings, horn, flute, yeah. bassoon. And what do you think it is about this instrument that makes it so popular with people? I think it's easy to make sound fantastic <laughs> play, you know what I mean? For, for example, like a piano, it's very difficult, you have to practice a lot. Yes. But for organs, just press one chord, and so you can be a conductor of a big band. Sometimes I have a concert in school for students, oh, yes. for children. I do like uh, pops and heavy metals. And so an organ like this can make a sort of heavy metal sound oh, as yes. well as everything else? Mm, no can I hear some? Yes, yes. Right, this is like heavy metal things. Heavy metal, right. mm -hmm.
fantastic. Yay. You're doing so much. Um, so it really is very versatile, isn't it? Yes. As an instrument. Um, and you play orchestral as well and mm -hmm. jazz. And yes. So do you consider yourself a sort of ambassador for the organ? Hmm? For the electric organ? Now you're an Sounds like Diana. <laughs> Sorry. It's Queen of Pipes. <laughs> Queen of Pipes. <laughs> so what was once a giant, immovable and complicated beast has now become a portable, easy-to-use domestic appliance. But of course, not everyone is a convert to this digital technology. Since 1915, this pipe organ at Balboa Park in San Diego has been giving delight to thousands of ordinary folk. Bob Plimpton is the resident organist at Balboa Park and a keen evangelist for the traditional pipe organ. As far as you're concerned, this is really about accessibility to people, isn't it? Yes, I mean, it is right here in the park and people can come and it's totally open, totally available to everybody and uh, weaves itself into the life of everybody. Do you think that it has too much of a sort of church connotation for some people? I don't, I don't think so. There are some people who do say, yeah, it's not like a funeral, but uh, we just ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's obviously going very well here at Balboa Park, but what about the organ in general? What's its future? Well, I really believe there's a growing appreciation for the organ as a musical instrument on its own and not just as a handmaiden to something else. And I find even in non-Western cultures, like in Japan mm. and so on, that uh, there's a growing interest in the pipe organ as a mm. musical expression. Now, notice you say pipe organ. You don't think the digital organ will take its place? Oh, dear, no. <laughs> Never. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> I think the digital organ will have its own place, but there's, there's just no replacement for the real sound of pipes with the real air going through them. But is Bob Plimpton right, or is Chiho Sonomoto's electronic orchestra about to make him redundant? Is the pipe organ now threatened with extinction by one of its own children? Thanks to modern technology, it is now possible for a digital chip to sample and imitate the actual sound of a pipe itself. Will these digital organs, cheaper and more portable than their predecessors, actually replace the traditional pipe organ? And is it possible to tell a difference in sound between the two? Well, here in the Great Hall of Alexandra Palace, we've set up a little experiment. To help me with this, we have a random selection of music students who are going to hear the same piece of music played on a real organ and also on a digital one to see if they can tell the difference. My lovely assistant Caroline, hello Caroline. Hello Howard. We'll hand out the blindfold. At the other end of the hall, we have two fine organists. Alex Mason, who's going to play the 1876 Willis organ, which has 4,000 pipes, and Nick O'Neill, who is going to play a state-of-the-art Allen computer organ, which has no pipes. So Caroline, are the contestants ready? Yes, Howard. The contestants are all ready. Well, let us commence. We're going to hear some Louis Vian from organ number one. <laughs> Organ number two. Thank you, organists. And now for the jury. Would all those of you who thought that the real pipe organ was organ number one raise your pipes?
Thank you. And all those of you who thought that the real pipe organ was organ number two, raise your pipes. Thank you. Now, please remove your blindfolds, and lovely Caroline will tell us the naked truth. Which was the real pipe organ? Well, Howard, the real pipe organ was organ number two, and the digital organ was organ number one. Thank you. Now, as you probably all now feel, some of you, about half of you got one and half of you got the other, um, which is uh, rather revealing, I think. I wonder, now, you're all music students, um, and you might have found it easier than, than the normal man in the street. Do you think for the, a normal person it would be impossible to tell the difference? Yes, I think they would, actually, because they were quite similar. If you've never heard one before, you would not know the difference. Mm. That's what I think. Of those of you who got it wrong, the choice, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, are you very sort of shocked that you got it wrong? I am. I mean, were you absolutely convinced? I thought I thought you'd be able to hear the difference just, away, just like that. You know, it would be smaller, but it was actually it was a big sound, yeah. which that I just was not expecting. Well, that's very interesting. Thank you very much for being guinea pigs on this occasion. <laughs> now, obviously, no experiment of this kind can be truly scientific, since every pipe organ has its own unique character. But the hung result of our jury does suggest that the digital newcomer is gaining ground fast. Of course, pipe organs have been around for centuries, and it'd be a very foolish man indeed that would write them off at this stage. In 1993, a British builder, N.P. Manda, completed a sumptuous new pipe organ here at St. Ignatius Loyola in the heart of New York City. Hundreds of others still being commissioned around the world, this glorious monster is undeniable proof that there's still plenty of fight left in real pipes. You know, I'm not much of a player these days. In fact, you could say I was bordering on the slightly crap. However, after 30-odd years, my passion for the organ is absolutely undimmed. And when I come and play an instrument like this for my own fun, I think, yep, there is a future for something so bold and so colourful and so beautiful.